to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Matthew chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. We welcome you today to our study of more about Jesus. Today we're considering what was Jesus really like? This one that we hear about coming from God, who is God with us, how did he live his life? What is the things he did that were important? What was his character and his person and his nature really like? And so we're so glad that you joined us today for our Bible study. I want to encourage you, if you would, to get your Bible or locate it. Have it ready as we're going to look to the Word of God together in our study about the nature of Jesus Christ. As always, our lessons are being brought to you by congregations and individual members of the Lord's Church. The Church of Christ in your area would we'll love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If that's on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night, they'd be glad to have you. You'll find people there who love God, who are concerned about souls, and who only want to do what the Bible says. In fact, if you've got a question, you'd like to have a Bible study, you want to learn more about worship or salvation or, or why we do the things that we do, Sit down with members of the Church of Christ in your local congregation and they'd be happy to open up the Scriptures and discuss that with you. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your desire to know God and His Word better. Won't you check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com? From there, we offer a wide variety of good, free Bible study material. We have DVDs, video lessons, audio lessons on CD. We have transcripts. We have uh, study questions, uh, digital downloads of all of that are available. Just go to our website, fill out a media request form. We'll make that available to you. And if you need a hard copy, we'll even pay the postage to get that to you as well. And friend, as always, we want you to know that our goal today, our goal in presenting these lessons is to take the whole gospel to the whole world and to help men and women know Jesus and His plan of salvation better. Thus, today, we're considering what was Jesus really like? Who is this Jesus? What do we know about His life and His character? And, and how did He talk and how did He act? And what are some of the things that were extremely important to the Lord and Savior. You know, when you think about Jesus Christ, society will often hold one of four views about the Lord and Savior Jesus. First view that, that some will take is that Jesus was a liar. That is, He had false miracles, He was not God, He did not live a perfect life, and everything that He said was not true. He was a hoax. His life was a farce and he was a fake. That's what some people will say about Jesus and that's the view they hold. Then there would be those who would hold a second view about Jesus. They would say that Jesus is a great leader like Moses, like Elijah, like John the Baptist, like King David. He was a great leader, good, physical, earthly leader, but not God. Uh, many Jews would hold to that idea that, that Jesus was a great man. He, the things he said were great statements, but he's not the Son of God. Just a great, one of God's great leaders sent to mankind then. Then there's a third view, and that is this, that Jesus was a lunatic. And he was crazy. I mean, think about it, they'll say. John 6, he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. John 3, he said, you've got to be born again. Mark chapter 3, he said, you're my mother's and my brother and my sister. And so they look at the things Jesus said and often take those out of context and, and just leave with the impression that Jesus was just kind of crazy. 
He was a lunatic. He wanted a following. And he did and said the things he did for his own following. But then there's the fourth view, a biblical view. Jesus was not a liar and not just a good leader. He wasn't a lunatic. Jesus is Lord. That's the view that the Bible teaches. Acts 2 verse 46, as Peter, or Acts 2 verse 36, as Peter brought his sermon to a climax on the day of Pentecost, he said this, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Saul of Tarsus held this view as well. In Acts chapter 9, when the Lord presented Himself to him on the road to Damascus, and He said to Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And Saul said, Lord, what would you have me to do? And so today we take the idea, the mindset, the teaching of the Bible, that Jesus is Lord and Savior. But what was He like? Consider this verse with me. As I think about the nature and the person of Jesus, and as we look to the, the gospel accounts, we can see first and foremost that Jesus was a man who was dedicated to prayer. Notice Mark chapter 1 with me. Mark chapter 1, I want you to look in verse number 35. The scripture records these words in Mark 1 verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. We see Jesus praying in the garden in Matthew 26 and in Luke 22. We see his prayer to the Father in, in John chapter 17. When I think about the life of Christ, certain times Jesus went and prayed all night. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus was a man who was dedicated to and realized the value of prayer. I mean, think about Mark 31, Mark 1, 35. In the morning, he got up early, went out to a solitary place. He got away from the rat race of life. He departed to be by himself, and he started every day. He started his day with prayer. Jesus realized the extreme value of being a person of prayer. And you can see other examples of men and women in the Bible who realize that. Daniel, for example. Daniel 6, verse 10. When Daniel is told not to pray, and he knows that anybody who does pray is going to be cast into the lion's den. Daniel, as was his custom from early days, knelt down on his knees with his windows open toward Jerusalem and prayed three times and gave thanks to God that day. You see Paul and Silas in prison. Acts 16, 25, they're praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners are listening to them. Now friend, we don't want our study of the life of Christ just to be intellectual, just for us to have some biblical facts about what Jesus was like. We want that study also to be practical. When I look at the life of Jesus, the Bible tells me, walk in His footsteps. 1 Peter 2.21, the Bible tells me to imitate Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. And that reminds us that just like Jesus, we need to be a people of prayer. Friend, do we realize the value of prayer? Luke 18, 1, Jesus said, Men ought always to pray and never lose heart. Friend, do you, ever, do you ever get discouraged? The word lose heart means to get discouraged, to be depressed. You ever get discouraged? You ever lose heart? You ever feel like sometimes just giving up and throwing in the towel? This is what Jesus said. Men ought always to pray and never lose heart. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. That isn't that everything we do in life is a prayer, but there should never be a time when we can't turn to God in prayer. Hebrews 4, 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. There is help to be had from the throne of God accessed through the avenue of prayer. Do you remember the words of James 5? Verse 16, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. Prayer has the power to overcome, to change things, to, to put things in, in our favor from the throne and the mind of God. 
And then, of course, Philippians 4.16, Be anxious about nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Let's then consider another aspect about Jesus' life that's very practical. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was also a man of logic. Logic is correct reasoning, correct understanding, uh, looking at the facts and coming to the right logical conclusion. And I want you to see this from Jesus' life in Mark chapter 2. Turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 2, and I want you to notice what the Scripture says in verse 17. They're questioning Jesus about how it is He eats and drinks with sinners. And listen to verse 17. When Jesus heard it, He said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Here are these, the Pharisees, the religious elite. And it looks like they're kind of offended that Jesus didn't come and rub elbows with them. Rather, He's eating and drinking with the lower, what they would think of as the lower sinners and scum of society. And so they begin to question Jesus' disciples. Why is it if He's the master teacher, if He's the Lord, why is He eating and drinking with sinners and tax collectors, the worst of society? And Jesus takes a little bit of logic and shows them the foolishness of their reasoning. He says this, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Now you think about the logic of that. If you wake up tomorrow morning and you get out of bed and you feel, you slept good, you feel great, and you say to yourself, man, I feel great. I think first thing I'll do this morning is call the doctor and go visit him. Well, that's not what you do. Those who are well don't need to go to the doctor. You go to the doctor when you're sick. What's Jesus' point? These are the people I came to save because they're sick. If you really are well, what you think you are, you don't need me. These people are the people I came to save. You can see the, the logic in Jesus' teaching there. And friend, the Bible teaches us to be logical, rational thinkers. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us, Prove. All things hold fast that which is good. How do you prove something? By looking at the facts and coming to the correct understanding. Isaiah 1 verse 18, God says, Come, let us reason together. They search the Scriptures daily in the first century. Acts chapter 17 verse number 11. And so, like the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we want to use our intellectual faculties. We want to use the ability to, to reason correctly from the Scripture to come to the correct conclusion. Friend, this is so practical because we live in a world where there's a lot of confusion, biblically speaking. There's a lot of false doctrine. There's a lot of error that's being taught. How are you going to separate truth from error? You can know the truth and it'll make you free, Jesus said in John 8, 32. But friend, you've got to do that by proving all things. Test the spirits to see whether they are of God. 1 John 4, look to the Scripture and see if that's true and reason correctly from the Bible. Jesus was a great man of logic. Thirdly, as I think about the nature of Christ, not only was He a man of prayer, not only was He a man of logic, but Jesus was a man of great power. I want you to look at one example of this in Mark chapter 4 with me. The context of this is Jesus and His disciples are on the Sea of Galilee. A great storm has arose. Jesus uh, is not even worried about that storm. And Peter tells him, Lord, we're going to perish. Aren't you going to do something about this? And he's, a, he's asleep in the stern on a pillow. He's not even concerned about it. And so watch what Jesus does in Mark 4 verse 39. Then Jesus arose, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But He said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now watch their response. And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey Him? Friend, when you think about the life, don't you know this must have made a great impact on the disciple? I mean, imagine being in that little boat 
on the Sea of Galilee. And the, 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 the history tells us the wind would come down off those sheer cliffs and white, white water would be everywhere. A lot of people lost their lives in ships in the Sea of Galilee. And the boat, water's coming in the boat. They're having to bail water. You can imagine the sea. Looks like they're going to sink and there's Jesus asleep. And Jesus just says, peace be still. And those tumultuous white caps, it's like a sea of glass. And the disciples look around at each other and they, they're afraid. And they said, who can this be that even the wind and the waves obey him? Friend, that reminds us of Jesus' power, but with a purpose. When Jesus fed the 5,000, when Jesus raised dead Lazarus, who had been dead for four or five days. When Jesus uh, cast evil spirits out or healed somebody of some affliction, and men and women saw the power of that, what was its purpose? To point to them to something even greater than Jesus' miracle, His words which can save. The purpose of Jesus' miracles and His power was to point men and women to His teaching that gives men and women eternal life. Now hear me well. The miracles of the Bible were great, and they had a great purpose. But miracles are not what saves mankind. The Word of God. We are able to be saved by the teaching and power of the Word of God, and that's what miracles pointed us to. James 1 verse 22, we're to receive with meekness the implanted Word, which is able to save our soul. The Word of God is living and powerful, sharper, they need two-edged sword. And so when I hear about Jesus raising Lazarus in John 11, there's something else I need to hear about. The words Jesus said after that miracle. I am the resurrection and the life. He believes in me. He'll never really die. Friend, a thousand times greater than the miracle of raising Lazarus is the words Jesus wanted us to hear. If you believe in Him, even though you die, you'll never really die. Feeding the 5,000. Few fish, few loaves of bread, fed 5,000 plus people. What, what was all that? That was powerful. What was all that about? I am the bread of life. Jesus said, if you really want to live, you really want to be satisfied, you've got to look to me. And so when I think about Jesus' power, all the miracles and signs that he did, Key us into His Word. Jesus said in John 8, 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Truth that Jesus spoke and that the miracles pointed us to. That's what sets man free. Let's then consider another aspect of Jesus' life. He was a great man of prayer. He was a great man of logic. You can see His amazing power that points us to His Word. But then we also realize Jesus was the perfect person. Look in your Bible in Mark chapter 7. I love these words. Mark chapter 7. I want you to look in verse number 37. One of the great statements about Jesus in all of Scripture. Jesus has just healed a, lame, a, a deaf and a mute man. He can't hear and he can't speak. Immediately his ears are open, verse number 35. The impediment of his tongue was loosed and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one, but the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. Now watch verse 37. Here's what they said. They were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Think about that statement. You want a summary of the life of Jesus Christ? Here it is. He has done all things well. Can you think of anything Jesus didn't do well, didn't do above and beyond? I mean, as it relates to sin, Jesus was perfect from sin. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. He committed no sin, nor is guile or deceit found in His mouth. 1 Peter 2, 21, Hebrews 4, verse 15. He did all things well in accomplishing God's will. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 17, 5. He was perfect in every way that a human being could imagine. He grew in wisdom, stature, favor with God, and favor with man. Intellectually, physically, socially, and spiritually, 
Jesus was everything you could ever imagine. Luke 2, 49 and Luke 2, verse 52. And friend, here's the application today. Am I perfect? Far from it. Are you perfect? No, none of us are. We all sin. There's none righteous in and of himself. No, not one. Romans 3, verse 10. But we can do all things well, and we can be obedient to God through Jesus Christ. I can do all things through Christ, the Bible says in Hebrews 4, uh, so strengthen me. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse number 13. And so if I want to live, if I want to know how to live the best life, if you want a, a hero and a role model for you and your children to follow, you want somebody that's the perfect, there needs to be a perfect standard. Who is that? The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was the perfect person in every way. Then let's think about this concerning Jesus. Jesus was also a man of proper priorities. Look in Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. The Bible records this. Jesus asks, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Priorities. A lot of life comes down to having those right, doesn't it? We look at people who have problems in their life. We look at people whose lives are in upheaval. And many, if not all the time, their priorities are not what they need to be. When you look at the life of Jesus, He put first things first. Listen to this statement. What will it profit a man who gains the whole world, loses his own soul, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul. What's priority? Number one, your soul. Friend, hear me well today. Your job, your occupation, your education, your love life, your desires, your recreation, none of that is the main priority. I'm not saying, I'm not saying necessarily that some of those things in and of themselves are bad, but none of that is priority number one. What's priority number one? Your soul and spending eternity with God is what it's all about. Why are you here? Why am I here? What's life all about? Friend, this earth is a veil of soul making. It's my opportunity to get right with God. Think about, think about Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. There's a man who had a great crop year, and so he said to his soul, Soul, you've got many goods made up for, laid up for many years. In essence, take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. God said to him, You fool, this night will your soul be required of you. Then whose things will those be whom you've acquired? And Jesus' point was, So is he who is rich, but not toward godliness. That was a, a man who was great in business, a man who had good fortune. There, he was set up for a long time. But in God's standard, that man was a fool. Why? He wasn't focused on the right priority. His time came. Knock on the door came. It was his soul being required of him. And he wasn't ready. Friend, it won't matter. In eternity, it won't matter how much education you've got. It won't matter how many friends you've got. It won't matter how much money you've got. It won't matter how many toys you've got if you didn't take care of your soul. That's what it's all about, making sure that I'm ready to spend eternity with God, that I'm seeking first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, that I'm seeking heaven above all else, Colossians 3, 1, that I'm living a sacrificial life, Romans 12, 1 and 2, and that my priorities are getting my soul to heaven above all else. Well, let's think about one last example from the life of Christ, of His nature, when I think of Jesus, one of the things that stands out so much is that Jesus was a servant of all. Look in your Bible in Mark chapter 10, and I want you to notice very briefly what the Bible says in Mark chapter 10, verse number 45. Jesus said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. The background and the context is James and John want to have, they want to sit at the right hand, left hand of Jesus. Their mother, 
has a mission for them as well. She wants that as well. And so the other disciples hear him talking about it, and they all began to bicker. Hey, we've all walked the roads of Galilee. If they've got that right, we do as well. And so you can imagine the bickering and the infighting. And so Jesus sat them all down, and he said this to them. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Life isn't about you and you being served. Life is about you serving. Friend, that's such a powerful lesson that I think especially our young people need to hear today. Life isn't about you getting everything you think you need. Life isn't about everybody waiting on you hand and foot. Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be served, listen to this now, but to be served. You want to find real happiness and real fulfillment in life? Find some way of serving. Jesus said this, only words of Jesus that aren't found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John or Revelation. Acts 20 verse 35, Jesus said this, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Be a giving person. Find some way of giving back. Find some way of serving. And friend, in doing that, you're embodying the nature of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as we think today about the life of Christ, let's think practically. Is my life being lived in such a way that it honors God? Am I following in the footsteps of Jesus every day? Am I even a child of God? Friend, if you're not a Christian, Listen to what the Lord said you've got to do to be saved. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 15. Jesus said, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3, verse 5. Saul of Tarsus was told, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Have you heard the message of salvation? Do you believe that message? Would you turn from a life of sin in repentance, making the confession Jesus is the Savior? And would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? And friend, would you come out of that water a changed person, following the example of Jesus every day? May God help each of us to live our lives more like Jesus every day, to focus not so much on self and our own selfish interest, but on getting to heaven and helping others. Please join us next time as we study more about Jesus. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the